Unfiltered, the official Sunderland AFC podcast. Welcome to SAFC Unfiltered, sponsored by Alpha Security. Myself and Danny are back here at the Academy of Light. We're going to speak to another former player this afternoon, aren't we, Danny? We are. We're going to have a catch-up with uh, Tommy Sorensen, who's thought highly of by the Sunderland fans. A uh, great goalkeeper, in my opinion. Didn't play with him at Sunderland, but spent a couple of seasons with him at Stoke City. And uh, no, really good guy and a really good goalkeeper. I guess over the years, Danny, Sunderland's had a reputation of having good goalkeepers. Generally speaking, you think about Sammy Mignolet, Craig Gordon, Jordan Pickford and at the moment we've got a possible new star haven't we in Anthony Patterson he's been saving penalties this season he was recalled from a loan last season and he's never been out of the stick since. No he's been he's been excellent for me I think he's um, just grown week by week um, as you mentioned there he's made a couple of good saves from penalties uh, a lot of the time in games he doesn't have too much to do but when he's called upon he's making good saves uh, I think his uh, distribution is generally excellent uh, and you just see him growing in confidence and he's, he's quite a calm character as well for, for a young lad um, if he does make a mistake or two it doesn't phase him he, he gets on with things and as I've said before for me he reminds me a lot of, of Tommy who we're going to speak to yeah it's a bit weird for me this because I definitely have pictures of Thomas Sorensen on my, on my bedroom wall <laughs> growing up because he was such a big figure I mean you know literally was a big figure but you know he came in as a successor internationally to Peter Schmeichel yep. and he was a big part of that Peter Reed side here on, on Weir side as well and of course he made that Really famous save in the derby at St. James's Park to deny Alan Shearer a late equaliser as well. Huge figure around the club, really, and, and still, you know, resonates with the fans, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, yeah. And he came in as, a, as quite a young lad, didn't he? Inexperienced. And uh, I think, you know, he would have been nervous. You know, you're the last line of defence. A lot of uh, weight on his shoulders in a way. But no, it looks like he had a, a good time here. Went on to have a good career. Obviously moved on to Villa and Stoke, as we say. 100 plus caps for his country. So, uh, yeah, he's had an excellent career and... Uh, no, I'm looking forward to having a catch up with him. Now, we will be on Zoom because he's on the other side of the planet, we understand. We'll find out all about that and about his time here on Weir Side right after this. Welcome to SAFC Unfiltered. Thomas Sorensen. Thomas, how are you doing? Yeah, good to have me on. Um, always great to uh, speak to people from the Northeast. Yeah, it's fantastic to have you on because you were part of a very famous side here on Weir's side. You're still well regarded by the, the Sunderland fans, but um, how are you and where are you in the world? Yeah, no, I've, I've lived in Australia for the last seven years now. Uh, finished my last two years playing at Melbourne City, uh, the affiliate to, to Manchester City. And uh, stayed on. Pretty nice weather, uh, different lifestyle. Uh, it's far away from family and everything. So uh, it was a tough few years during COVID, but now uh, we can travel back. And, you know, I, uh, I do go back a couple of times a year. So it's nice. And do you do, a, I understand you do a lot of uh, media work as well over there. Is that right? Yeah, so that's where I, you know, I keep my contact to, to the English game. I work on the, on the Premier League, um, you know, so... So that keeps you involved. I work on the, the A-League, which is the, the local league down here. I still have a, a connection. I'm an, an ambassador for Melbourne City, so I'm still sort of in and around you know, their home games. So, yeah, so I, I keep involved and I keep my taps on what goes on at uh, Sunderland as well, which is nice uh, just to, to keep tap on, on my old clubs. That's good. We'll come on to that. But I think we should start at the beginning. And where were you and um, how did you find out about your, your move to Sunderland back in the day and who told you you were signing for Sunderland? You know, it, it came about uh, a little bit out of the blue, really. I was, I was talking to, um, you know, I was highly regarded. I was in the under-21 national team um, and, uh, you know, I was sort of in and out. Should I continue my career in, in Denmark um, uh, or should I, you know, try to take one of these opportunities that was sort of coming my way. I was talking to Udinese, Ajax, and then out of the blue, uh, Sunderland came in. And, uh, you know, honestly, uh, you know, I knew they had been in the Premier League, but I didn't know too much about the city, about stadium, about the club. Uh, and, and I was sort of a little bit hesitant, but ended up going up and, and meeting Peter Reid and seeing everything there. And, and as soon as I, you know, just uh, talked to him, saw the people at the club, uh, you know, saw, you know, videos of, of the games and the atmosphere. I knew 
at that point that that was where I wanted to play. And I was also given the opportunity by Peter Reed, you know, to to at least start the season. So so that was important as well, you know, to 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 potentially you know be a first team player. Yeah, I was going to say, Tommy, because you were, I think you were 22, weren't you, when you come and join Sunderland and relatively young and experienced, I think 50-odd games under your belt. Um, so in, for a goalkeeper, obviously young and um, you're saying it there and I was similar myself. I, I joined when I was 24, but you just you just get the, the area quite quick, don't you, Tommy, in terms of what it means to the, the fans in the area. Football, they live it daily, don't they? Yeah, for sure. And, and that was the thing that, um, you know, I think inspired me to, to uh, you know, to go there, um, you know, just to to sense that passion, um, you know, that, uh, you know, live and breathe football, um, which I've obviously come to know that that's, that that's the way of life in the Northeast. And uh, uh, and I got to experience it. Uh, first game against QPR, full stadium, uh, fantastic atmosphere. I, I, I must say I was myself a little bit in the dressing room before the game uh, because it was, it was a little bit different than uh, playing in front of, uh, you know, a couple of thousand back in, in Denmark. And, and as you said, I, I hadn't played a lot of first team games. Um, and uh, to be fair, I, I talked to Peter Reed a, a few years later and he, he did say that, you know, I, I, he, he'd given me a four or five games and if I didn't perform, he would have uh, looked elsewhere. So thank God I uh, <laughs> no had the team as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you played with some big fan favourites in your time at Sunderland. What was that dressing room like and are you still in touch with any of them? Yeah, no, again, it was a fantastic dressing room when I actually just started to be able to understand what was going on. I came with my uh, my English from, from school, which we, you know, we, we, we learned it from an early age in Denmark, but I didn't have a clue what was going on when, when they were joking in the dressing room. So that took me a couple of months to, to get into that. But it, it was a great atmosphere. There was such a... A social side to it as well, uh, you know. Back in that day, you know, it was a little bit different. We 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 could go out to the pub and have a drink. Uh, you know, there was a, you know, there wasn't a the mobile phones in the dressing room, so so obviously people, you know, got a gab about it, playing table tennis or whatever was a, was around and uh, was socializing off the field as well. So so I remember that as a fantastic time, and um, you know, as such a cohesive team, and we had the success on the pitch obviously as well, which helped. So uh, some good characters, you know. And Al Quinn, he was, he was the father of the team, and uh, you know, uh, you know, there, there were some youngsters. I still, you know, I still do a podcast actually with Michael Bridges. He was one of the youngsters at that time, you know. So there was there was a huge array of experience. Uh, obviously, Kevin Ball, um, you know, who was the the captain. So yeah, there was a there was a, it was a, just a great group. Some some funny people and some serious people like myself. <laughs> what were the elements in that squad which made it so successful, Thomas? Was it the balance, the skillful players, the hard tackling players as well, and the mix of all different characters, wasn't there? Yeah, no, I think you touch on it there. I think, first of all, I think you've you got to have the right mentality. And I think there was there was uh, a good culture, um, you know, and, you know, that was upheld by, yeah, Kevin Ball and Niall Quinn. And then we had the quality as well. You know, we had... You know, obviously, Alex Ray was in the you know midfield. Uh, kept with Kevin Ball. We had Alan Johnston, uh, Nick Somerby, and and then you know Kevin Phillips sort of stepped it up a, a couple of, of levels. H him and his partnership with uh, well, now Quinn was exceptional, and you know they obviously got us the goals. But I thought we were pretty solid. We had you know Paul Butler at the back. He signed at the same time as as I did. Jody Craddock. Michael Gray, obviously, uh, you know, so there was just a, a heap of, of talent and, and work ethic and everything else that just made it, uh, yeah, just reach a higher level, really. I think the Stadium of Light was only a year old, wasn't it, when you come up to, to play for Sunderland as well. But in terms of the academy where we're sat now, the Academy of Light wasn't here during your time, was it? I think you were at Charlie Hurley, is that correct? Yeah. And, uh, talk us through it. We had Jill Scott on uh, a couple of weeks ago <laughs> and she said it was uh, a lovely place to, to train every day. <laughs> Actually, I did. I did get to. Uh, I did to get uh, to feel the transition. I think. I think the training ground finished maybe a year before I left the club. And so, um, but yeah, Charlie Hurley. I don't think there was a there was a calm day. Uh, the wind was always coming off the sea. Uh, I mean, yeah, you know there there was you know I remember that at, at the new training ground as well. But uh, yeah, just those porter cabins, pretty basic. Uh, not a lot of uh, great facilities. Uh, kitchen was pretty sparse, um, but yeah, we got on with it, and I don't think we ever, you know, questioned it or anything. I think people, 
it was just what it was. And and um, and again, you know, there was just a good atmosphere. So I, I think people just got on with the job. Uh, Cookie was obviously doing his kit and everything else. And, you know, so there was, um, yeah, everyone was there. Do you think that added to the determination of the side back then? Uh, I, yeah, I, you know, it, it's part of it. it. You know, we didn't, we definitely didn't have glamorous uh, uh, training facilities. So, um, you know, we, we were not going to rest on our laurels, <laughs> you know. So I, I think, you know, we, we just knew we had, um, you know, as Danny said, you know, we had the Stadium of Light was, was you know, a top, top facility, great pitch, um, amazing atmosphere. And I think that, that you know, then I couldn't really care less where I trained, you know. As a, and I don't, I think everyone else's attitude was like that. We uh, we got on with it, and you know we knew we had a fantastic uh, advantage come come Saturday or Sunday whenever we played. And what was training like back then? How how hands on was Peter Reed back in the day? And was it a lot different to goalkeeper and coaching right now? <laughs> uh, he was pretty old school, uh, really. Uh, Bobby Saxton as well, um, you know. And I think that that was the way he'd run it. And I think that's where you know the, the players that were at, at the club at that time I think it suited everyone um, pretty old school in general just get on with it work hard play hard and uh, yeah there was obviously t- tactics involved but but it wasn't you know to to the modern day standards uh, obviously with analysis and, and everything else you know it, it was really mostly like attitude first of all you know crossing that wide line you had to give a hundred percent for for the club badge and for your teammate. Uh, and um, and then we knew we had the quality on, on on top of it to to add to it, and you know had some uh, you know Tony Corden was there the first I think four five three months maybe I was there because uh, he had a dispute with the club and and, and sadly had to to leave, um, and then Pete came in um, and and yeah I had some some good coaches there and uh, some good uh, you know keepers around as well that could push me so so yeah always remembered as a as a good time and, and a learning full time as well and obviously tommy promoted in the first season you were here back into the premier league um and then a good couple of solid seventh place finishes um what, what are your memories from from your time really i mean obviously i think the one that'll stick out with the fans is saving a penalty from uh, from alan shearer <laughs> in the derby what, what would you say yourself yeah no again i think um you know first of all play, playing in the premier league i, I you know one of the things that, that definitely stick out was that first game we played against Chelsea because we we came chests out uh, into Stamford Bridge and I, I just remember looking out around in the dressing room. I thought we, you know, here we come. We're going to show. We're going to, you know, we're going to spring a surprise here, and we got absolutely destroyed. <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, and we, we we had a big reality check, and I thought it was good because we we came with so much confidence, and it, it just. It, it just showed us that this was another league that we had to step up our game. And, and from, from then on, we, I think we beat Watford in, in the next game and, and won a, a, from there. And, and as you said, finished seventh. But yeah, the derbies um, were tremendous. Um, I, I had a, obviously a good experience, uh, you know, playing in those, uh, winning, uh, I think, two, two of them at St. James's Park. I think we had one uh, in, in some torrential rain and, Kevin Ball hit the uh, our Mark, Mike Cross bar from uh, a sliding <laughs> tackle <laughs> with, 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 with about five minutes to go, I think, where my heart sort of stopped for a second. But yeah, you know, you know those are the games and you can sense it. You know, Danny, you played there uh, as well. And, you know, that, that's, that's why, you, you, know, that's, that's why you, you, you play football for those games, you know, for, for that atmosphere and for that, you know, just that it means something. You know, that, that's... that's also part of it like we do we, we put so much effort in you know the fans you know they spend their hard-earned money on, on, on these games and, and everyone invests a lot of time and effort into to this and and that's why these derby games I think uh, are so important because you know they you know they can give so much back to just not players but but families and friends and and most of all the fans and the club so you know so they stand out surely for from my point of view and, and that's Shira save obviously it, it's a minute save but you know again in, in the folklore of things it's obviously hugely important and, and it didn't it, it didn't sort of hit me until you know a fair bit later how you know how important it was it was sort of regarded can you still remember the moment the penalty was given away and you knew deep you know it was like 82nd minute or something like that wasn't it that 2-1 up 
this was all down to this moment. And can you remember thinking which way he was going to go? Because there's a certain amount of knowledge that goes into penalty saving as well as, you know, look at times as well. But did you do some research on which way he might have gone? Yeah, no, again, I think you, you sort of, uh, you know, first of all, I think it was Niall Quinn, actually, who for some reason was in our own box, um, as I remember it. Um, and, and But when that happens and, and your first little sort of anguish over it that disappears, you, you go into a, you know, you go to into penalty mode. And um, I, I knew that that Shira normally would strike it uh, to the keeper's right, high right. Um, you know, that's what he loved to do. And, uh, and and you know it was it was for me it was it was should I bluff should I try to you know will, will would he change because I knew that because everyone knew it because it was highlighted you know on TV pretty often uh, and yeah I, I sort of decided for the bluff and uh, you know tried with my movements to sort of put him off and yeah it worked it wasn't a great penalty and you know probably not an, an all time save but it was bloody important <laughs> Tommy in regards to the penalties it's something we've had discussions with in, the, in recent weeks obviously the World Cup and, and goalkeepers writing penalty takers names and where they like to go on on their drinks bottles and stuff and um, <laughs> one thing I was going to ask you about is you know subbing goalkeepers for the sub goalkeeper I think Kepa's one isn't it you look at where he's come on in penalty shootouts and that is that not a bit disrespectful to the goalkeeper who's played the 90 minutes how would you be happy if you were getting subbed for a replacement keeper to come on and try and do your job you know i think it depends on the, on the situation they are you know when you look around and you know i i was lucky that i had a coach when i was sort of uh, at a young age who actually put a lot of emphasis on on penalties so so if you, you if you actually put a, a fair bit of hard work in you, you can improve your you know at the end of the day it's a percentage you know if you can improve your percentage to you know, I think a normal keeper is probably 20. If you can improve it to 30 or 40%, then uh, you're already up. And, you know, if you have a keeper that is, you know, <laughs> a fair bit better than the other one, um, and if I knew I was playing alongside someone that was that good, uh, you know, I could probably respect the decision, but uh, it would be hard to swallow. Uh, <laughs> and, and we've seen it work. Uh, obviously, t Tim Krull, I think, was the first one that did it with the Dutch team at the World Cup in Brazil. And Kepa has... It, it better bloody work because otherwise, uh, <laughs> you know, you'd be few. <laughs> yeah, you've saved some um, penalties in, in your time. Danny, you've got some, some stats on Tommy as well when it comes to penalties. You actually saved a penalty from uh, Cristiano Ronaldo as well on international duty. Yeah, I mean, it just shows how important you can be at the back in those decisive moments, I guess. Yeah, uh, no, it, it comes to the story. I actually committed the, the foul against him, so, uh, so I had to save that penalty. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think it shows that with anything we do in life and in football as well, like if, you, if you put the effort in, and Danny would say as well, like as a defender, if you put the effort into to your positioning, to your heading, to your tackling, you know, you, you naturally become better. And, and uh, I think that's the same with goalkeeping. You know, it's, it's sometimes an overlooked thing. Uh, it's, it's just something that goalkeeping coaches expect the keeper to, you know, to do something about. But, but you, you can actually work on strategies. And, um, and, and nowadays with, you know, with uh, all the footage you have on players, you know, I remember my last couple of years when I was at Stoke, you know, they had, they had footage of players uh, when they were playing at youth level. You know, that this is what he did since he was uh, 15 years old. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, that has definitely changed. So you can work, a, you can have a strategy. And I think that's important in, in football in general that, that you have uh, a strategy. Tommy, I'm not sure if you've seen too much of us this season and Anthony Patterson. Um, are you known too much about Anthony or not? And uh, what type of goalkeeper you're seeing him? Yeah, no, I, I, again, you know, it's hard for me to, to, to watch the game. So, so I, I, you know, I hear something from people and, you know, I'm, I'm liking what, what I'm seeing. I think uh, that there's been a search for, for that keeper. There's been, you know, a, a little bit of a merry-go-round. And, you know, I think it's important that you, you know, you, you get settled in that position. And, you know, he's definitely, I think he's, he's done well from, from what I've heard. And, um, you know, that's, you know, that, that's, uh, you know, a great, great start. And we'll, we'll see where it goes from here. You know, it's important for the team and especially in such a tight league as a championship to... Uh, you know, to to be solid at the back. Yeah, because I've I've compared him to yourself a bit, Tommy. When we we obviously do the the live streams for the games on a Saturday and discussed goalkeepers and his type of character. He's very calm. He's qu quite quiet for a goalkeeper. He's obviously 
like yourself when you came to Sunderland young into his career, uh, but he's growing for me week in, week out. He's making some fantastic saves. Saved um, the penalty the other week. Saved, saved a couple of penalties <laughs> yeah. this season, hasn't he? Yeah, so um, yeah. I, I, I'd say that type of goalkeeper behind me, and I said about yourself, not just because you're on the podcast with us, but quite a calm <laughs> influence behind you. You know, crosses come in, come and claim them. And, you know, there's obviously different types of goalkeepers. You look at Jordan Pickford, who's the opposite, really. He's quite vocal, isn't he? He's always in the thick of the action. Perhaps Kasper Michael a little bit similar as well, getting after his back four at times. And, um, you know, there's obviously different types of goalkeepers out there. But I put Anthony in the, the category of yourself, really. Yeah, no, it's good to hear. I, I think at the end of the day, you know, because I, I was sort of facing that sort of choice in some way as well, because I, I took over Peter Michael, who, who obviously was a you know, a little bit, you know, towards that Pickford uh, end of the spectrum. And, and everyone sort of, oh, but you've got to do the same. You've got to be the same, you know, kind of person. And, and you can only be who you are. And, and I think ultimately you've got to do something that works for, for you. And then you'll grow into that. You know, he's still, he's still young. So, you know, he'll, he'll add layers to it. As you said, he, he's growing and, you know, he'll make his mistakes and, and hopefully learn from him. And, and, uh, and then you get more and more comfortable you know, with your back four and, and the communication and, and, you know, experience helps a lot. You know, you, you, you see the game and, you know, the game slows down. I think it's a cliche, but it does. You know, when, when you get older and more experienced, uh, you see things before they happen and that's where you can really make a difference. And I suppose as well, because in this day and age, the way football's gone, he's expected to almost be an outfield player at times, isn't he, with his feet and the distribution comes into play, playing out from the back, perhaps a lot more now than what it was 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, for sure. You know, again, you know, I, I faced that at the end of my career here at Melbourne City in you know Australia, where the coach wanted me to to be an outfield player. And you know, as much as I worked on it, it was never a natural thing because you know, for the first twenty years uh, of my my footballing career, I, you know, I just had to boot it, put you the know, ball I, down, and go long I, to I, Quinny. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> Hey, and I played seven years with Tony Pulis, and I, you know, I, I was not, I, I was not, I was not allowed to, to play short one time. You know? So, uh, you know, that, and, and thankfully, it looks great, and it, it's it's made the game so much more exciting, and um, you know, a lot more complex as well for the goalkeepers. Let's just step back a little bit, Tommy, and speak about those, um, in particular, those two successive seasons where you finished seventh in the Premier League at the time, particularly after the second time you finished seventh. Did you feel that the club was it was inevitable that the club were going to kick on and you know bring European football to the club. Yeah, no, I think there there was that belief for sure. Um, uh, I, I think it was that year we we lost Don Hutchinson, I think, um, and he. If I, I think it was after the second season where we finished seventh, um, I'm not 100 percent sure, but but losing him, I think, was was massive because he he provided that. You know, first of all, work ethic and and goals from midfield, and then we, you know, there was players signed, and some of them worked. Like Stefan Swartz was was a tremendous player, and then other players, Tori Andre Flo came in a bit later, and we just, you know, it just started to sort of lose its way a little bit. So the, you know, the core, of the team, uh, Kevin Ball retired, um, and, and then suddenly. We, we just couldn't quite. We, we were trying to reach the le- next level, but we actually ended up taking probably a step back. And, 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 uh, and you know, and I saw the same when I was at Stoke. You know, sometimes you, you have a core and you have a, a culture and everything else. And, and then when that changes, and if you, don't, if you don't get it quite right, it can start to then go in the wrong direction. And, um, yeah, sadly, it started then from, yeah, from, from that third season in the Premier League to, to sort of start slowly go in the wrong direction. Yeah, and I just want to compare it to, to now and what the people who are in charge of the club are trying to do with the club right now. They have a, a kind of a strategic model where they're trying to buy or recruit very young players, very unknown players with the right stats and they uh, they apply them to the system they have in place and they, they believe that will bring a lot more longevity and success to the football club. Do you think that's a the right way to go down and you spent a lot of time within football is that the way successful clubs do things you know i'm, I'm definitely fully behind um you know proper scouting players not just on ability but also on personality uh, and then first of all as you said you've got to have a strategy on you know what do you want to be as a club uh, where do you want to go who do you want to employ uh, and then you've got to stick to that like we, we've seen it successfully you know brentford have, have done it really well 
you know, uh, Brighton, um, you know, even Southampton, even though now they're, but they have also sort of built from the bottom up and, and, uh, and uh, and I think it's it's it, it's shown to be a successful model because you know it's you know there's not a money tree in a back garden you know it's not a, a Chelsea who can spend a billion dollars or or Man City you know I think Sunderland tried that back in the day and 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 fell short so I think it's a great approach I think strategy is hugely important in modern football and 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 you can see that the play, the the clubs that do have a clear defined strategy. Um, they tend to be the most successful as well. Yeah. What were your feelings as a former player as well, someone who was very heavily involved in the club, when you saw Sunderland dropping down the leagues in, in recent years? Obviously, we're on the, the other end of that trajectory right now, but how did you feel when you saw us you know, doing the double drop and things like that? No, it, it's obviously something that hurts. I think, um, you know, I, as, as many other people watched the, the, the documentary Sunderland Till I Die and yeah, it was it was it, it was not great watch. <laughs> it was not a great watch. Uh, you know, a lot of people thought it was great insight into, but 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 then it, it's a, a club that sort of you, you you have close to to your heart and with so many great memories. And I know, uh, you know how much it, it hurts the people of Sunderland and the fans. Um, then um, you know I, I'm yeah really happy that it's at least going in the right direction now and. Uh, there in the championship and, you know, still within touching distance. I know the last couple of results haven't been, you know, great, but there's still a, a possibility to get into the, to the playoffs and, and that should be, still be the target. Tommy, where would you say in terms of, you know, like myself, you've had several clubs throughout your career and played a lot of games for, for different clubs, um, just shy of 200 for Sunderland. Um, where would you say Sunderland ranks? Because a lot of people will say to me, what is your club? Like players tend to have a club, don't they, in their career? And this is perhaps the club that gave you your opportunity, obviously, in English football and to kick on and put yourself on a platform. Would you say that Sunderland would be your club if you had to sort of choose one throughout your career, if you know what I mean? Yeah, it, it, it definitely holds a very, very special place because, you know, those first years, my introduction, the atmosphere that was there and then the connection, you know, to to the fans and, and the club, I think... Uh, I think you're probably right. Uh, you know, as as I don't like, you know, there, there's there's different clubs, different things, but it, it's definitely right up there uh, for sure. And uh, yeah, I think the the first couple of years, I think, were definitely unmatched uh, in any years later in my career. I think uh, they they were special the first three years, um, the atmosphere and the the excitement that was around the club and. That's something I haven't experienced since. So, so you can say that that definitely ranks uh, right at the top. What about coaching, Tommy? Are you doing any any thoughts about any coaching, or have you done any since you've retired, or just happy with the media work? <laughs> yeah, no, I have taken my sort of initial license, uh, but um, <laughs> you know, I like the challenge and and um, of 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 the coaching, but. Ooh, it, it's it's a, it's it's hard work. As Bridgie, as Bridgie put <laughs> and, you and off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, they, they, it's it's a it's obviously a full commitment, and I I must say I've I've prioritized you know spending time and having time off when my kids are off on on holidays and 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 you know I, they've you know committed a lot during my playing career and you know to, for me to start coaching and and not seeing them ever again I think. Uh, <laughs> That's uh, that. That was not something I, I wanted to do, and I think my place is 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 probably more, um, you know, behind it as a as, as a sporting director or, or somewhere else, uh, you know, around the FA. Uh, I've done a degree in Ue at UEFA in, in football management, so so yeah. So that's what that's more where my sort of perspective lies. I think um, you know, trying to develop strategies and like we've just talked about. And then I guess you've got a boy and a girl, is that right, Tommy? So are they into their sports yeah. as well? Yeah, my son, uh, my son, I, I was hopeful he was going to play football, but, uh, you know, he, he, you know, he was more into his friends and going out and looking after his girlfriend. Uh, so, so that, uh, but, uh, you know, my daughter is, is heavily into sport. Like she's, uh, she's doing rowing uh, at a pretty high level. And, uh, yeah, so, so, and she's got more sort of my, my mentality. So, uh, you know, it's great to have a bit of both. They're both great kids and they both have their interests and, you know, that that's what you just respect. Yeah. 
And Good. Tommy, just a quick word on your international career as well. Over 100 caps for Denmark, taking over from the, the huge figure in the game, Peter Schmeichel, you know, and, you know, how, how do you feel that the, the Danish squad are right now? You've obviously been well documented in recent years. We had the moment of Christian Eriksen happening on the pitch as well. That must have been a horrific time for everyone involved in the international setup. But to see what, what he's come back from, that must be great as well. Yeah, no, again, it, it, it was a... Uh you know, unique world moment in in so many ways. For, first of all, for the negative initially and then for the positive after and and how I think it galvanized the, the Danish team and, and United, uh, you know, Denmark uh, behind uh, behind the team as well. And, and to see, obviously, he, he's, you know, he, he's a good friend of mine and um, I, I've, you know, we're from the same part of, of Denmark and, and I actually, during the, when that was his first World Cup in 2010, we shared a room together during the whole World Cup. So, you know, so to to actually sit there and I was in the studio in Australia commenting on the game, uh, and I had to I had to leave. You know, it was it was horrible. Um, but yeah, it, it's turned into a fairy tale story, and, and Denmark uh, have done well uh, except for this last World Cup, which was a disaster. But other than that, I think there's a great feeling around the Danish team, and you know they. There's such an atmosphere around the games and excitement. So, yeah, so it's great to see. And they are playing some good stuff, uh, you know, bar, bar that horrible time in Qatar. Yeah, right. I'm conscious we're up against time. And Danny's got his quiz questions ready for you. So oh, five, oh, here we go. Yeah, here we five go. quick fire general <laughs> knowledge questions. I do believe. Is that what you got ready for? Him? Yeah, quick five, Tommy. Mixed uh, general knowledge okay. questions. So we better fire away, as you say. We're getting short on time. So the first question is, which language has the most native speakers is it English or Spanish? Uh, Spanish. Spanish is correct. Nice one. Good start, Good start Tommy. Tommy. Good start. Wow, like Question number two, Tommy. Which Premier League side currently has the most Danish players in their squad? Oh, that's Brentford. It is Brentford. How many? Oh, uh, I would say five. Four. You don't get oh, no, 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 no bonus, bonus points. No, yeah. no bonus points, but uh, you're doing well. Two out of two. Roslev, Norgard, Jensen, and Damsgaard. There's your four. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. Okay. Yeah. Question number three: Which Netflix show had the most views in 2021? Like your TV shows, Tommy. Uh, 2021. Um, most views. On Drive to Survive. Squid Game. Squid Game, yeah. Oh, oh Squid. yes, yeah, yeah. That was during the pandemic, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're still doing all right, two out of three. Yeah. Right. Number four then, Danny. Question number four, okay, Tommy. Right, okay. Question number four, <laughs> how many stars are there on the flag of China? Oh, stumped one. him. Is it not one? Five. Okay. There's, yeah, there's, one, right. there's one big Sorry. one and there's four small ones just alongside uh, it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Come on, I, last one. Come on. And the big oh, one. I meant one big one. Yeah. One big one. Food and drink question, Tommy, <laughs> to finish. Question number five. Which fast food restaurant opened first in the UK? Was it KFC or McDonald's? I would say uh, I would say McDonald's. That would be the that would be the uh, you know the, the logic answer. But you know I, I presume it's a trick question. <laughs> I'll say McDonald's. I'll say McDonald's. It's probably wrong. Right? <laughs> McDonald's opened in 1974. KFC opened in 1965. What? Yeah. Okay. Not in Sunderland, yeah. they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that, that's what we that's what we're talking about, isn't yeah. it? Exactly. Yeah. yeah stumped you there. Okay. Yeah. Good okay. effort. Good effort, Tom. Uh, Two out of five. Start. Don't worry. Right. There's been right. yeah. there's been people yeah. doing a lot worse than you, Tommy. Well done. Um, ah, okay. All right. Okay. Thanks. So I need to brush up on my Netflix. Yeah. I need to brush more. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks so much for joining us today, Tommy. I'm sure. Uh, on behalf of all the Sunderland fans, we'd love to see you back at the Stadium of Light one day and be guest of honour. And I'm sure you wouldn't have to put your hand in your pocket for a drink either because you are definitely <laughs> a fan favourite. Thank you so much for your time at the football club. And I'm sure if you did come back, everyone in Sunderland would welcome you with open arms. Yeah, no, I hope so. That would be uh, fantastic. I hope to be back in, in Europe uh, sometime at least uh, in the in start of the new season. So, yeah, it would be great to, to touch by and. Let's hope, let's hope it'll be in the Premier League. Go the Mackens. Yeah. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's get up there. Yeah. Cheers, Tommy. Good to have a catch up, mate. All the best. Thomas Sorensen here on the SAFC Unfiltered podcast. 
he's exactly what I thought he was going to be like. A lovely bloke. Uh, obviously had an extraordinary career, both internationally and domestically as well. Fans himself now in, in Australia uh, doing his media work as well. Um, great guy. And someone you worked with as well at Stoke, Danny. Yeah, it looks like he's enjoying himself there. Recently retired. A good career till the played till he was 41 there, Tommy. Um, finished off in Australia, as you say, Melbourne there and enjoying life. But uh, no, fantastic goalkeeper. A great bloke as well off the pitch. Um, you know, sometimes goalkeepers, they, you get one or two strange ones. <laughs> I've, had, I've had a few in my career as well. But uh, no, Tommy, great character. Um, say fortunate to spend a couple of seasons with him down at Stoke City there. And uh, what a fantastic career he had. Um, and just the way he speaks there, really. You can see he's obviously maybe not looking at going into coaching, still in and around the game with his media work and uh, looking for, for other jobs in the in the trade still. Yeah, absolutely. Let's look at uh, our first team at the moment, a little reflection on maybe where we're at at the moment. Find ourselves just outside the playoffs yeah. after a couple of um, bad results. Um, you know, at the moment, but uh, there's still plenty of games to go. And as you've seen uh, in the league table, a couple of wins and you're right there amongst it again. Yeah, we are. You know, we, we keep saying it. We're into the business and I think we've got 12 to go, haven't we? And yes, we have had a dip, um, which we haven't said too much this season, have we? So it's hard to be critical of the boys too much, I think. Um, energy levels perhaps haven't been there in the last couple of games, although we've been in games as well, which is the frustrating thing. I think you look at Rotherham lost there 2-1 but we could have we could have scored 4 or 5 on the night couldn't we yeah and it's been um, pretty full on as well in yeah. terms of games we had the FA Cup run right. as well it's been you know Tuesday, Saturday you know pretty relentlessly lately yeah. hasn't it well it has yeah and you're right and just having that break now with no midweek game I don't know obviously we got Stoke at the weekend they've played last night so uh, you'd expect them maybe to be feeling it a little bit more although they did make a few changes um, but yeah we're back on, on home soil at the weekend Alex Neal coming into town I'm sure the crowd will be up for that one and uh, no it'll be an interesting one but we need to get back to winning ways of course we do as you say we're still in a good position we've, we've dropped in, in terms of points and performance levels but we need to get back on it still a long, lot of football to be played and we're still right in the mix. Yeah, and maybe we'll see some more of those players we brought in uh, in the January transfer window as the season progresses as well as yeah. they get up to speed. You know, the likes of Isaac Lahadji, maybe. We'll see more of Jefferson Bennett, yeah. maybe. Who are, as well. Yeah, Come Pierre Equa as well. And it's all about, you know, trying to assess where we're at at the moment. Using this time, the break, as you say, from the midweek games. We've got an international yeah. break coming up as well. Hopefully, you know, we get some people back up to their... You know, back up to the best, you know, yeah. as we, we do the running. Yeah, we do, yeah. And, and look at the fixtures as well. A lot of teams in and around us to play, haven't we? Um, so it's vital that we do uh, up the performance levels and, and start picking up some more points. Um, but as you say there, we've, we've relied on a sort of good core of the squad. But Lihadji's come in now. He's had, I think he's had a run out for the 23s. Um, he had a little taster a couple of weeks ago, didn't he, coming off the bench. Equa similar. Um, you've got Abdullah Bar who's been in and out. Jefferson Bennett come on and had an assist at the weekend for Ahmad's goal down at Coventry. So yeah, Tony might be weighing things up and thinking, can I bring these in? Can I look to rotate it a little bit? He did down at Queen's Park Rangers, didn't he, a couple of weeks ago, got the result there. So he's got to weigh it up and, and try and balance the minutes really. But as you say, we've got a, that cluster of games coming up now. Then there's that international break as well for, for a week or two off. So uh, we, need to, we need to get back to it. Yes, we will be back to it and we'll be back soon. So please subscribe to SEOC Unfiltered on all your favourite podcast platforms. We'll be back soon.